First Peter chapter 1. If you'd care to join me there, please. First Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 22 and following. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and following. Follow along, please. Verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Let's pray together, if you will. Father, thank you for allowing us each one to be here today. Uh, Lord, as our eyes close and our heads bow, we can everyone think of the situations that we've come through in the last few days the uh, circumstances that we're living through right now, and they're all so different. People from different parts of the country gathered here today, different parts of the neighborhood. But God, we know as students of the Bible that you're in and around and above and below and right smack dab in the middle of everything that goes on to the point the apostle could say that we know that all things work together for good to them who know you and to them who are called by your purpose to be a part of your purpose. Well, what a privilege then it is to gather here today and know that we were, uh, as it were, rather uh, pulled off to the sideline here together, pulled over on the shoulder for just a few moments realize that you're at work in each life here. Amen. And Lord, we just want to be mindful of what you're doing in each life and be supportive of one another. Mm -hmm. Life's not an easy thing. We're trying to serve you, living for you, following you, that's, that's not an easy thing either. So God, thank you that we can be together here for a few moments. Now yeah. We're going into your word. God, we need your touch. There's obviously nothing about me that would help anybody here today. I can't even help me, much less someone else. But God, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we together today, Lord, ask you for a blessing through the preaching of your word. Please open our eyes that we can see wondrous things out of thy law. Please grow us. Lord, please do what you do. We ask it in Christ's name. And all God's people said. Amen. <laughs> the uh, title for my message this morning, one word, I did better than last week, Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia, can you imagine such a thing? Our last time together, we began our study of this last segment of chapter one that I had entitled, Obeying the Truth, what it did, what it calls for, and how it happened. And as we began looking specifically in verse 22, uh, I noticed out loud three parts of Christian conversion. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. Part one, it was this, through the Spirit that it happened. Part two, it was by obeying the truth. Part three, it results in a person's soul being purified. Wonderful, wonderful things for us. The Holy Spirit of God revealing the truth to your mind, to my mind. If conversion ever takes place, it will only be because at that point you, me, obeyed that truth. And if you obeyed that truth, your soul then was purified. Purified. But there's one more thing to be said about this obeying the truth, if you will. What it did, what it does. I'm sure you noticed it in the text. It produces an unfeigned love of the brethren. Unfeigned love of the brethren. I don't know about you, have you used the word unfeigned lately? Anybody? Old-fashioned word, but it carries quite a meaning to it. The word unfeigned basically means not pretend. 
not put on, not hypocritical. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, if any of you husbands ever tried to put on a good face when you know your wife's mad at you for something? Nobody in there, huh? I think Kenneth just leaned a little more on port side. I don't know what's going on back there. We can all relate to this. Uh, of course, we're talking about it in a spiritual sense here. Unfeigned is not hypocritical. Then the phrase love of the brethren actually translates from one Greek word. And it's the word Philadelphia. It really is. And it can be translated as fraternal affection. Fraternal affection. So if we pause right here for just a moment, we can already see that obeying the truth, what it did or what it does, uh, not only purifies the soul, but according to the text here, it produces a not pretend fraternal affection. It produces a not put on fraternal affection. It produces a not hypocritical fraternal affection. Some of you are looking at me like, oh, that's nice, but how about let's get into something we can understand. Well, I hope I will. I want you to be sure and notice now these definitions notwithstanding. We're not told from verse 22 uh, to put on, if you will, unfeigned love of the brethren. We're not told to do it. We're not instructed uh, to have a not pretend, not put on, not hypocritical, fraternal affection. We're told that this unfeigned love of the brethren will be the result of having this purified soul. Now, by the way, and I say this often, uh, but I mean it every time that I say it, the Bible was written in such a way that it requires study. Uh, it was never intended to be like a comic book. Do they still make comic books, anybody? Oh, yeah. Still make them? They used to make Superman and uh, Batman and I don't know, have, Carol, did they have comic books when you were a child? Oh, yeah. I did a bad ink back then. Black and white. Somebody called it. Thank you, kid. I appreciate that. <laughs> Fraternal affection, uh, this unfeigned love of the brethren, is a result of having a purified soul. This requires study, though. You've got to spend some time. You've got to scratch around. You've got to want to make it work out. Or you just won't get it. It's just that simple. Now, in last week's lesson, I pointed out that in a genuine conversion, there's been an actual supernatural phenomenon take place. Uh, I, I use those words, I don't know any better ones to use, but what I'm talking about is the fact that in a genuine conversion, the for real Spirit of God literally gets close to you and He communicates to you the truth of the Bible. Uh, Y'all, don't ever get over the wonder of that. We don't see the Spirit of God and if you're like me, I don't always feel the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God nonetheless does the things that the Bible says that He does. Amen. And if you're genuinely converted, it began by the Spirit of God coming close enough to you to speak, not necessarily to your ear. And when I say heart, I don't mean the pumper, but that thing on the inside where all the spiritual activity takes place. He communicated to you, you need to get right with God. I don't know what words you may have been listening to, whether it be your mama or your Sunday school teacher or the preacher, but you need to get saved. You need to be born again. You need to start seeking God. You need to get ready for heaven. The preacher was visiting uh, an old sister sometime ago who never came to church. And he asked her quite frankly, don't you ever think about the hereafter? She said, of course I do. Many times during the day, I'll walk to the kitchen and think, what did I come in here after? <laughs> I'll get my shirt, would that help him? <laughs> Man, if you're saved, it's because the Spirit of God came and spoke to you. Don't ever get over the wonder of that thing. You never see it. But the Bible says that it's so. This is going to sound harsh. I don't mean it that way. But since we know that's the truth, don't you know that this morning in hell, 
there are people who regret having heard but did not stop and listen. Truth. Amen? You all were Bible believers. <laughs> we believe it's the truth, whether it's a pretty thing or not. Now, you don't want to ignore the voice of the Spirit of God. But what we're being told here also in verse 22 about this unfeigned love of the brethren is another supernatural phenomenon. This is something that God did. It's something that God did to you and to me. A newly purified soul, if you will. God takes that soul and literally produces a fondness, an affection, uh, if you will, an inclination, an endearment in you for the brethren, for your fellow Christians. God does that. You didn't do it. I don't do it. Christian discipline doesn't do it. Attending church doesn't do it. Reading the Bible doesn't do it. God does it. God does it. Now, I hope that you're both willing and able to get on the same train track that I'm on this morning and can follow this. If it's true that this unfeigned love of the brethren comes by the Spirit of God, producing or uh, revealing the truth to you and you obeying it, Him then... Uh, uh, purifying your heart. If that is the truth, then understand this thing. God has come and done something that you had absolutely nothing to do with. If you, as it were, woke up one morning and realized, wait a minute, I feel an affection that I didn't feel before. Before you were purified, it won't there. After you were purified, it is there. Someone suggested a way to demonstrate this is by way of comparison. So if you will, follow me now, and let's make a comparison. Prior to your conversion, after your conversion, okay? Let me ask a few questions and set the stage. Do you remember the way you felt about going to church prior to your conversion? Okay? How about do you remember the way you felt about church folks. Now y'all, some church folks have 1 Peter 1.22 down pat. You ever been in a church where folks like to hug you? Amen. Okay? Now some people are good with that. And I do it, I get hugged because some people like to do that. I ain't a real hugger. We had some kin folk come visit the other day and I remember what I was doing outside cutting some grass or doing something. But you know what happens when you cut grass in August? I know you ain't supposed to say certain words in church like sweat or nasty, but I was nasty sweaty. Now, Gator can't appreciate that back then. But I told them, hey, don't hug me. You know, they're like, take it back. Why not? Don't you like me anymore? No, if you do, you won't like me anymore. Okay? <laughs> Hugging, we don't need to do that. But some people really have that down pat. Well, prior to your conversion, you may have been one of those types. You walk into church, you want to sit on the back row. No offense, anybody. You don't want to be noticed. You don't want nobody messing with you. You certainly don't want some old sister to come up and grab you around the neck and squeeze a starch out of it. Can anybody relate to that? How about testimony services? Before you're converted, you mess up, you go to church, and you find yourself in the middle of a service where people stand up, and before they even start talking, they start crying. And you're thinking, why did I come to church tonight? I could be home watching TV or beating up on my little brother or whatever the case is. And they start talking about the sweetness of being saved, about how they care about the living real Jesus walking with them and talking with them and out come the tears and then comes the hanky and they're wiping their nose for obviously reason wiping their eyes I've even been in services where they start shaking their hanky back and forth and I don't know what the deal is but y'all it was real and before you got saved if you're anything like me you didn't care for that kind of stuff man let's get on with it let 8 o'clock get here so we can get out of here and go home how about Bible preaching? You won't say, but you ended up in a church where the preacher was preaching the Bible. The Bible is known to step on toes. Anybody? 
If you can sit through a Bible sermon and not get your toes stepped on, something's wrong somewhere. I don't know exactly what it may be. And then there's the preacher. Now before you're saved, he comes around wanting to shake your hand. Don't shake my hand. I don't want what you got. And then he shows up at your front door. Won't that a blessing? Remember, I'm trying to make a comparison here between things that you felt at one point and now you feel differently. How about an invitation hymn? Just as I am without one plea. By and by it starts dawning on you. Them people are singing like they mean it. And you want to get away from that thing. Good night. And then how about when things got ramped up and not only were you not saved yet, but you're coming under conviction. Now if you're here this, this morning and you're genuine saved, I don't mean you're a church member. I don't mean some slick marketing ploy has got you on someone's roll and you followed the crowd into the church. I mean you're born again. If Jesus comes busting through the sky this morning, you're excited about it. You ain't got a care in this world. It's all over but the shout. Amen? Amen? If you're here today, you know what it's like to be what the old timers call under conviction of sin. The preacher's talking to me. How did he find out what I did this past week? How does he know those things about me? Why don't he talk about somebody else once in a while? Can you remember the way you felt before you obeyed the truth? Do you remember the way you felt in that interval, if you will, of feeling guilty before you came to Christ and had your sins washed away by His blood? Do you remember how you felt? Then you stopped running from God and things changed. Now I realize these things may not happen overnight. I don't know how all this stuff works, but I know it does. Once I never wanted to go to church. Now I feel like something's wrong if I don't go to church. I can miss one service and say, okay, it won't be too much longer. Miss two or three services and I feel like I've backslid. Anybody here? And those preachers, now you may take offense to this, I hope you don't. Some preachers you don't want to get too close. I don't care if you've been saved twice. Them guys are just nuts, amen. <laughs> Good time to amen. Go ahead and get it out of your system. But there you were before you'd wiggle and squirm and try and crawl under the church seat prior to your conversion. Now you want to hear the man preach. You want to hear what the Word of God says. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but it's talking about me. I don't care. I want him to talk about me. When I lay my head on the pillow the night in bed, I want to know if I die before I wake that I'm going to go to heaven. Yeah, no, that's old-fashioned. You'll think old-fashioned. When the funeral home's knocking at your door, I rolled up at a stoplight yesterday. And here comes, what do they call the, the new kind of wreckers? Where they don't just drag you behind, they roll the thing up on the truck. Roll back. Roll back. On the rollback is a hearse. And I was sitting there first. He comes up beside of me. Now, I'm, I'm not even embellishing this. He rolls the passenger window down. I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Roll your window back up. And I was waiting for him to lean over and say, Need a lift? <laughs> <laughs> You'll think old-fashioned. <laughs> when the angels show up, Yo, this is real. I ain't died yet, but I'm going to. And guess what? You too. Every one of us. Amen. Amen. Good night. No, man. You got saved and things started changing. What was it? What, what made the difference? The Spirit of God has made a difference. You didn't go to school to learn how to stop not wanting to go to church. What happened was God the Spirit literally came down, sat down inside of you, and started making changes. And now you want to be in church, and you want to hear the Bible preached, and you want to hear about heaven. I used to wonder, why do old people always like to talk about heaven? I don't know, was it like that when you grew up? The old cats love to talk about heaven. Well, I'm an old cat now, and I'm finding out why. I may be there this afternoon. Anybody? Amen. You youngsters sitting around there, well, I got a lot. There's a TV commercial on now. Uh -huh. And I know you love come church to hear about TV commercials. The woman says, I'm in my mid-60s, and I've got a long life yet to live. I've got big plans. I'm thinking to myself, honey, I hope you're right. 
But statistically, you may not be. The old saying was, one foot in the grave and the other foot on a banana peel. You get to that point, you want to hear about heaven. Amen? I want to know everything there is to know about it. What happened? You stop running. God got your attention. Compare the difference in the feelings. That may be the best way to demonstrate this idea of God getting involved and feelings changing. You didn't learn anything. I didn't learn anything. The feeling changes. God places in our hearts a fondness and affection for our new family members Amen. in the body of Christ. Now, I specifically like this, y'all, because it has nothing at all to do with me. And let me clarify. This is not something, again, I have to learn to do. Anybody here have any trouble learning anything? Now, the, this is a true story. A cable guy told me some months ago, he's trying to explain to me how to hook your box up, the little flat thing, to your TV. I remember a day when TVs didn't need boxes. They just needed a table. Anybody? Yeah. You know, I ain't not, not old enough to do that. Yeah. He's hooking it, and then, then he's got like three remote controls for two devices. I said, why? Then he rattles off some great long string of words. Okay, now that I don't understand that, tell me why. Better still, get it so I can push one button and watch what I want. He starts explaining it. Y'all, this is the truth. I had this dumbfounded look on my face. He said, wait a minute. Do you have any grandchildren? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. I said, yes. He said, they can do it for you. <laughs> Sometimes you just get too old to learn. So I'm glad when I come across something in the Bible, I ain't got to learn how to do it. God does it. I just love it, y'all. Hey, by the way, Christianity's real. Amen. Christianity's real. I ain't the same as I used to be. Not what I ought to be. I grant it. And, and she can fill in the details there. But things have changed. And I'm glad for all of them. I just wish I hadn't waited so blooming long. Now, don't get me wrong here. This principle about unfeigned love of the brethren uh, can be entirely misconstrued. I'm of the opinion. Entirely discombobulated. And the result of that can be heartache and confusion. It does not mean that once you get saved, you're going to begin to love, quote unquote, love everything and everybody in the church. Now I want to point that out because of this. Every Christian... Real, genuine, bona fide, born-again believer is first a Romans 3.23 human being. He's a sinner. She's a sinner. Amen? Uh, I'm going to say this about Lee because I got a head start. He won't be able to catch me before I go out that door if necessary. He sang about he himself being on Jesus' mind when Jesus was on the cross. Lee's a sinner. Amen. And he saved sinner. Like everybody here, I hope. But he's a sinner, and because of that, he's going to mess up now and again. Amen? Well, you, you ought to see what I saw the other day. Well, it don't matter if I saw it or not. And we're all that way. Every single one of us. So every Christian in every church is, first of all, a sinner. Be sure and remember that. Secondly, every church has Christians that are in various stages of Christian growth. The Bible confirms to us that when you get saved, you're a baby in Christ. What do babies do? Anybody? we got a couple of new ones coming in the family. Lou said, oh, ain't that sweet? I hope they'll let us keep them. I don't want to keep them. <laughs> Bring them and let them visit. When they get to squalling, y'all, come on, time to go home. Or at least go out on the porch. I'm sorry, I'm hard-hearted. But that squalling gets me. What do babies do? Drink milk. Drink milk, mess up diapers, and squall. Anybody? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Babies in Christ, I hope nobody gets mad here. When they don't get their way, what do they do? Not mess up their diaper, but squall. I want my way. Well, okay, so, so do the rest of us. But every church has not only babies, children in the faith, Adolescents in the faith, young adults in the faith, 
mature adults in the faith. I don't care what church you go in. Even with genuine, honest-to-goodness saved folk, everyone's in a different stage of growth. Therefore, there are going to be zits. There are going to be problems. You ain't going to necessarily love everything and everybody in the church. Thirdly, there are churches that have what Jesus called in Matthew 13, tares that resemble wheat. You remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? Planted good seed, everything's cool for a while, and then those things that all look like wheat all of a sudden start taking on different characteristics. Tares, by the way, T-A-R-E-S, King James for weeds. You got weeds growing with the tomato plants. I don't want no weeds. Why is it, somebody? You buy tomato plants. You pay money. You put them in the ground. You fertilize, you water, you fertilize, you water, you pray, pray, pray. And for the first couple of weeks, they grow yay much per week. Amen? On the other hand, the weeds, you curse them. You stomp on them. You spray weed killer on them. You teach your cat how to attack them. They grow 12 inches every hour and a half. Anybody got that figured out yet? It happens. We've got weeds in our flower bed that look better than the flowers in the flower bed. She says, what are we going to do? Enjoy it. Amen? I like it. Jesus said, there are those, and they end up in our churches, who look sort of like wheat, but they are tares. You're not going to love everything they do. And I, I want to be sure and hit on this so we, we grasp this. But not only that, fourthly, many churches have what we call backsliders. And these are people who were once close to God, but now they've slid away from God. And the trouble with all this is, Jesus said in Matthew 7, every tree is known by its fruit. So wherever you are in your Christian life, you're on target, backslidden, you're a tear, you're a juvenile, you're a baby, it shows by what you do. You cannot hide what you are in Christ. I can probably for a few minutes, and then I get up with my wife. She knows better. Anybody? Anybody? Try not to cry. <laughs> but a tree is known by its fruit. That's the bad thing, if you will. That's, that's the negative side. Of it. Yeah. Simply meaning that not everything that you encounter in church will you be fond of in fact, to the contrary, you will encounter things in the church that you should not be fond of. Amen. Simply meaning not everyone that you encounter in church will be doing things that you'll have an affection for. To the contrary, you will encounter folks in churches probably that you should not be fond of. And because of that, new converts can become disillusioned by someone in the church. You see, the new Christian, if you will, the fellow newly purified, reading his Bible, praying, seeking God with all his heart, only to come to church on occasion and hear sister so-and-so gossip about the preacher, gossip about the deacon, gossip about the choir leader, gossip about anybody, gossip about everybody. She's thinking, what in the world? I didn't read that in the book this week. I'm not supposed to be doing that. Comes to church and hear old brother so-and-so tell a smutty joke or make some comment about some pretty woman. Totally inappropriate, but there it is. Here's old brother so-and-so lose his cool in a business meeting when he don't get his way. Can anybody give me a witness? As far as I'm concerned, you can take every business meeting and throw it in the pond somewhere. I'm not interested in anything that allows anybody's flesh to come to the surface and then we vote on it. My vote is, we ain't allowing that around here. I didn't get no amens. I love it. I'm going to repeat it. How about that? No, I'm just teasing. You'd be surprised. We Baptists are known for keeping records of all that we do. All the people we bring in. Someone suggested, why don't we keep records of all those we run off? <laughs> do you know how many people we have on this church roll today that haven't been here for years? Dead silence. Carol, wake somebody up, man. <laughs> and I'm not blaming it all on the church. But y'all, if we get up and start acting in the flesh, don't be surprised when people leave the church. 
As I see all that at work, what do I want to come to church and get more of it for? Now, you ain't going to love everything that goes on in the church, even when God's doing that. So they see inconsistencies. Oh, sister so-and-so, you know, she ain't been there for six months. This is inconsistent. And the new believer thinks, wait a minute, am I supposed to be fond of that kind of behavior? Am I supposed to be acting like that person who's obviously not acting like the Bible says? Of course not. Oh, God will never make us fond of sin in any form, in any person. Never, 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 never. Amen. But never let bad behavior wrap you. Expect it. A amen? I mean, I hate to say it, but we need to learn to expect it. Mm -hmm. Because churches are made up of people. That's right. And we people are just the way we are. And if, every time I look at a mirror, I'm reminded of that. Good. Somebody said, well, I thought Christians were supposed to love everybody. Well, the answer to that question is yes, but. That's not what we're being taught in 1 Peter 1.22. We'll get to that next time. A little more clarity as I bring this thing to a close. And by the way, that's the equivalent of deciding you need to pull off the interstate. Okay, you Put on your turn signal, look in your mirrors, take the exit ramp. I'm headed that way, all right, everybody. Somebody pat Bill on the shoulder, give him a little encouragement. The word Philadelphia, literal Greek word, comes from the Greek uh, philadelphos. It's a compound word. Two, two uh, pieces, if you will. Philos means dear, a friend, actively fond, friendly towards. Second part, a delphos means a brother. Anybody here ever heard of a place called Pennsylvania? You ever heard of the city Philadelphia? Anybody ever heard of the fact that the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is known as the city of brotherly love? Wonder where that came from. You probably figured out just by our definitions here uh, that the English word Philadelphia has been what scholars call transliterated. It's been rendered into English from the Greek language. Philadelphia, love of the brethren, fraternal affection, if you will. Now, to help us understand this word Philadelphia, I need to point out that there are at least three different Greek words used in the Bible that are all translated by the same word love. In fact, later on in verse two, or 22 excuse me, is another completely different word. But because of that, that's why we have to study. We have to make sure we know what we're being uh, told here. Uh, there's the word agape. That's Christian love. That's commitment to Bible truth. And that's used in the second part of verse 22. Also used in John 3.16. Different word. Translated love. There's the word eros. That's intimate love between a husband and a wife. There's phileo then. That's brotherly love. Affection. Endearment of the brethren. And for our subject today, this Philadelphia, love of the brethren, unfeigned love of the brethren, what we're talking about is an honest to goodness fondness for those who love God the way you now do. I thought about this thing the other day. Most probably everyone in here has children or will. I don't know how it works, y'all. My son came home not too off a long ago and had this little blonde-headed girl on his arm. Now, I didn't know who she was from Adam. She could have been an IRS employee for all I know. But then I got a few of the particulars and all of a sudden, you know what it's like? You had an affection for somebody you don't even know. Well, why was that? Because she loved my boy. That's all it took. I'm sure she ain't perfect. She's probably as rough around the edges as I am. But she cares about somebody that I care about. I thought, this sounds a whole lot like this unfeigned love of the brethren. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I find myself loving God. And now I find myself having affection for others who love God. I'm now serving God. I feel a fondness for those I see who are serving God the way I'm trying to do now. I see myself wanting, I have, I have this hunger uh, for the things of God now that I didn't have. I see other people with that hunger. I just have a feeling for them. You know what I'm talking about here. And we're living in the last days, y'all. Your Bible student, you know what I'm talking about. In fact, I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 for just a minute. 
and point out something you know this probably better than I do. Second Peter chapter 3 verse number 1 Paul writes to Timothy, This know also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's a fine how to do it. People in love with themselves. That could never happen, could it? Don't you wish? Don't you wish? And with all else that can be said about that, it seems to me that church, quote unquote, has become an extension of this attitude. I love me more than anybody else. I put out something bigger and better to try and entice you to come in because I know you're addicted to yourself. How did that get in our churches? And then wonder why our churches can't spiritually fight their way out of a wet paper sack. It's because the power of God is gone. Just because somebody sits in a church pew don't mean that they're a Christian. Any more than sitting at McDonald's makes you a French fry. It's got to be more to it than that. Amen? Amen? Gosh, in this world, it just breaks my heart. People come, ought to be coming into God's church, saved people, saying, what can I do for you? How can I fit in this structure and help the work of God? Amen. If somebody said that this day and time, I think I'd fall out. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, let me faint for a while and get up and recover. <laughs> it's a sad thing to say, y'all, uh, but this God-given fondness is going to be for those who are doing the Bible. That's what ties it. <coughs> we sing around here the old song. Bless me the tie that binds. And you know what that is? It's the truth of God's book right here. Amen. You look at me and think, man, you'd make a pretty good preacher if you'd just get your act together. <coughs> I'm going to get my act together someday. As soon as the sky busts open. Amen? <laughs> and I might be thinking, you'd make a pretty good church member if you'd get your act together. Trouble is, ain't none of us got our acts together, but we've got God who loves us and sent His Son for us. When I see that in you and you see that in me, we love one another with this phileo, this Philadelphia, a fondness for one another. We learn to look over others' faults and see what they're out for. Yo, if we could get that in the Southern Baptist Convention, we'd be a different outfit. Last statement. You're here today, you're a believer. If at any time you sense in your inward man that this fondness for fellow believers is no longer there, I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to despair. But I do want you to repent. Tell God, listen, I don't know what happened. But it ain't there like it used to be. And I want you to renew me. I want you to change me. I want that affection for my brothers and sisters that I once had. You say in your Bible, it'll be there if I'll just obey the truth. I wonder how important it is, y'all, that we have affection for one another. Husbands and wives, how important is it for y'all to have affection one for another? I'd much rather have a big kiss on the cheek than a frying pan on my head. Okay? Well, just a few you feel that way? Maybe I'm preaching the wrong subject. Y'all, it's important that we have affection for one another. Amen. It really is. We're asking about your head, like we always do. I'm going to pray. I'd like for you to pray with me if you would. First, we'd like to pray for any here this morning who don't know Christ personally. Secondly, we'd like to pray for any who, like me, don't have the kind of affection in my heart at all. But I don't want to leave here that way. And thirdly, I want to pray for everybody in this building. This week will be the best week we've ever had for Christ. Will you pray with me? God, how needy we are. How desperate I find myself week after week after week. We would like to pray, Lord, there may be someone here who's never given their life to you. 
Only you can do that. But as you're presenting the truth, God, please convict that man, that woman, that young person. That there's really no choice. They've tried everything else to try. They know, you know, we all know. They've come up lacking. But there's a better life for you. We pray for those whose fondness for the brothers and sisters in the faith may have flagged.